Don't allow what anybody out there tells you is possible or not possible for you. So welcome to a big deal, Little Joe podcast. We got a special podcast today because we're not talking bodybuilding. We're talking powerlifting, which is something fairly, fairly different from what we usually get. We haven't had any powerlifters on yet, Joe. No, 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 not at all. But um, I'm really, I'm really uh, enthusiastic today because we have some of the best powerlifters and we have my friend Jay, who's one of our local, I guess, Jay was powerlifting back when I started bodybuilding and he was, you know, uh, running the circuit. You were in the cage back then, right? Doing the animal cage. Yeah. yeah so I've been powerlifting since about 2009. Yeah. I think I stopped in 2016, 2017, that area. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a long time. It's, you know, but. I think here you're you're kind of like a local legend, man. When you look at Jay Nera, you're like a legend here. So I, I don't feel like it anymore. Yeah, and there there was a small point where, you know, I could be like, I could be getting my groceries or something, and I might have some young kid walk up to me like, "Oh, hey, you're that animal guy, Jay Nera," but <laughs> yeah. it hasn't happened in a while. It has that hasn't happened in probably like two years so yeah well i don't know man in my heart in the heart of hearts i still think you're like the best power lifter who ever lived so <laughs> thanks <laughs> andy what do you say you guys know each other from competing and of course our other guest still on the circuit today andy do you want to talk about your competition history too and i'll let jay speak to his i'll let you guys just go through what you've done um i don't know who wants to go first Andy, if you want to speak first, what you're doing and next, I don't know, because of the state of California and the U.S., what's going on with powerlifting right now? Are you guys able to compete? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like month to month, but... Um, yeah, like your bodybuilding. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the current state. So, um, like, I just competed in September, and originally the meet was supposed to be in uh, New York, Buffalo, but that state's shut down. So we actually moved it to Kansas City last minute. Um, so that was open. That was a good, uh, you know, good, good place to run a meet. Uh, everything was fairly open. And then, um, so, but then, so in California, everything's just about shut down because uh, I have a lot of athletes like who are local and they want to compete, and they just had um, a meet in December get postponed, and so because of the recent like re lockdown, so. It's kind of like month to month. We never know what's going to happen, you know, state to state, all that stuff. Um, so the next meet I'm planning to do is called the Kern, the U.S. Open. It's in uh, April. It'll be here in San Diego, like an hour away from me. Um, so as far as I know, that's on. But uh, so that's kind of the current, uh, you know, situation. Um, so I started powerlifting back in 2016. Um, probably at the tail end of when Jay was, you know, getting out of it. Uh, but I, I had followed, uh, you know, Animal and had followed Jay and uh, Garrett Griffin and Richard Hawthorne. So like they, they were definitely the guys like I looked up to and, and wanted to be like and get in the cage. So it's really cool that like we actually finally got to meet Jay like two or three years when I fight, when I got the opportunity to lift in the cage. So that was cool. Um, so I've been competing about five years. Um, I think my first two years, I just I took off like a like a rocket. I was every meet I was like PRing, adding like a hundred pounds to my total. And by the end of my first year, I was like top three in the world in my weight class. Um, and I was just competing all the time. I was just loving it. Uh, but, but then, you know, you get to a point where all that stopped, all the newbie games stopped and uh, then injury set in. And, um, and also I was like chasing this world record and I was so close to it that I just, I was like one meet away, one good meet away. But then I started getting hurt and I rushed my comeback. And so it kind of just kept, you know, the cycle kept repeating. I would rush back, compete, get hurt or, or train and get hurt. And then, so um, now I'm kind of like, I had a big injury about a year and a half ago where I tore my growing and adductor uh, um, squatting. And so that kind of finally like really told, like helped me 
slow down and take time to like rehab and not rush back into a meet. Um, the meet I just did, it was kind of like a, just like a, a low key, not trying to push any numbers. Just want to like get on the platform again because it's been a while. Um, so I think in the next year or two, I'll probably be, you know, back to where I was or surpassing what I used to be. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, currently, I'm like top three or four in my weight class uh, all time. Uh, the top guy in our, our my weight class, I'm sure everybody knows, is Larry Wheels. So, uh, that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, who? yeah. Was, was uh, he that guy at the Arnold Expo? I, I think he was at the Arnold. No, I'm joking. Yeah, you know, we know who Larry Wheels is. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, where I'm at right now. I start as far as competing. What 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 weight class is that, Andy? Uh, the 275 pound weight class. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Man, that's a that's a big boy. You guys are big boys. Jay, Jay, your weight class was what? Two uh, it's primarily a 220, but around the end, uh, I started like competing in the 242. Uh, yeah, you got heavy. My, my heart is a 220. Uh, I, I like myself as a 220, like a 230 pound human, as opposed to like 250, 255. I feel kind of useless. Outside of powerlifting, I feel kind of useless when I start yeah. getting heavy. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, you got to take your winter boots off. It's like, ugh. You know, it's like, or you're in the change room and you're sweating because you're trying on these pants that don't fit. And I'm just like, oh, this is, you guys all know what I mean. Yeah. How, how tall are you, Jay? Uh, I'm like, I'm like a short 5'9". Okay. So I'm you're like, he's like, a short 5'9". I'm, like, I'm like 5'9 and a quarter, but I have a pretty shitty posture. And so oh, okay. I'm really like 5'8 and a half unless I'm like doing this. Yeah. But, <laughs> Jay, what were what were your best lifts, man? Well, I'm just curious. Were they were they uh, deadlift and and squat? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Like my best, so my best squat is 733. My best bench is 505. My best deadlift is 780. Those are my best lifts. Um, I wouldn't say any of them was like a spectacular lift. Like we're talking, I always think poker hands when I think of lifters. I think of poker hands. So I'm like a. a Queen Jack, Jack, on my lifts. Like it, somehow, like a queen total at meets, because a lot of guys are like queens or kings, and then tens. You know, Andy's like sitting. You have like an eight forty, eight fifty squat, right? Yeah, eight forty three. Five five twenty benchish or something like that. Eight forty three right? deadlifts. Yeah. Eight forty three deadlifts. So like, Andy's sitting at like a king, queen, king. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's your bench, Andy? You said five what? I've done in the meet. I've done five twenty three, and I've done five thirty five in training. Fuck. Yeah, that's a big. That's hard to do. And you're so all like all three numbers. You're you're like a two k lifter. You. Lift oh, I'm almost twenty two hundred. Twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. We start. You start thinking kilos when you get that, and start thinking he's almost a, a thousand kilo. thousand kilo lifter. I'm seven that's, pounds away from that. <laughs> that's dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing an RPS. Um, what was his name? Brady? Was it Brady? Uh, the one who did that. The, Jay, you were there, I think, that year. It was an RPS meet. He did two two point something. I think was his total two. Twenty. Maybe. Yeah, he was wearing he was wearing wraps though. It's a different. Yeah. Was he was he wearing wraps? Because he yeah, had I'm a big bench. Take away from that, that's still really good. But I mean, two two seventy five hitting two k yeah. in wraps is very different. Yeah, well, it's it's just very different. That's B plus. Help. It's a B plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I have so many questions, but but I don't want to I don't want to bog you guys down with all these questions about powerlifting, like different divisions, and you know different I, I, even different different uh, organizations, right, and federations, because I know RPS is out. Um, Gene passed away. Rest in peace. I don't know if um, you guys ever, uh, Andy, do you ever compete in RPS or was that something that was? Uh, no, because it's, it's just not relevant or not relevant. Not, uh, it's not popular in <laughs> California. And it's mostly, <laughs> uh, well, it's mostly like uh, uh, Upper East Coast, like New York area. New York, yeah. Um, so out here is more USPA. But you could just get the Wilkes and go to the Arnolds with that. Like there wasn't, with the RPS, you couldn't really move ahead, right? Uh, no, uh, the Arnold is like, that's not like a, uh, qualification, qualification only like kind of meet, um, the Arnold, are you talking about like, like a, the competition? 
Yeah, like I thought the only competition you could qualify through RPS was for that with your will. Well, yeah, because that's the RPS XPC yeah. meet at the Arnold. So that's like specific to RPS, but that's not like... So know. that's what I mean. There's not really, you know, it's like saying Joe's an IFBB. At, like we're both IFBB. I'm an amateur. He's a pro. If I wanted to go pro, I'd have to get my pro card, blah, 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 blah. But if I competed in NABA, which is a open, I think that's a natural organization, but... Yeah. Are there any other tested organizations? That, anyways, fuck. But if I competed in another organization, I'd be limited because I couldn't get an IFBB pro card. So right. powerlifting, how's that work? I'm, I'm sorry for the stupid questions. I no, know this... there, there's no like, okay. Yeah, first of all, there's uh, a whole tested side. That's, that's like the USAPL and IPF world. Okay. They have like more of like an Olympic system where like you have to win nationals to qualify for worlds. Now, on the untested side, it's like free game. There's just so many organizations. There's no like one, one national. There's like 100 organizations. I would say there's probably three popular organizations, but they all have their own nationals. They all have their own world. So that's, that's kind of like one of the problems in powerlifting. There's just no or, like one unified federation to like have, you know, all these qualifications and require the best of the best to compete with each other. People can stay in just RPS and only compete RPS. Um, but at the end of the day, that what what does matter is your total and your in your record. Yeah. Uh, and 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 when you guys were you were talking about like your 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 poker hand, Jay. This is what I'm wondering. What do you guys? And I didn't know when I was going to ask this question, but what about um, specialized lifters? Like um, what do they call them? <clears throat> the one lifts only, like the the bench. Like Gene Gene was a bench press specialist. Specialist. Yeah. yeah. Special. What do you guys think of is that? And that, I wanted to touch on that when we talked about, you know, powerlifting now and powerlifting five years ago. Because I know if I watch a movie like Power Unlimited, like you guys have obviously seen, I don't know if Joe has, Power Unlimited is a documentary about um, powerlifting. It's a really good documentary if yeah. you want to get some knowledge. But like... Oh, no. uh, is it on Netflix or something? No, you can get it on YouTube. It's like YouTube, one of those yeah. free ones. Oh, okay. But it, it's, uh, it's awesome because like everybody's debating like these bench specialists and like, are they relevant? And this is, I want your, I want a real power lifter's take, because I know you guys had a good, solid, well-rounded three lifts. So what's your take on that? Ahead, I yeah. think like you almost have to look at the times as well uh, when we're looking at that. Um, like, right, like when I say my, my poker hand, like my Jack, Jack, whatever I am, whatever I said I am, Queen, Jack, Jack kind of thing. Like when I started lifting, those were like, I was like a king, queen, king kind of, but the sport has evolved because it's grown so much, right? Okay. And a lot of those guys were lifting in a different era when there was equipment and that changed the sport completely. Um, or or more, more precisely, the introduction of raw to the world changed the sport completely because that opened the gates to start getting more athletes in. It was like this huge door is up there. Like I didn't power lift. Cause I go to the gym, like this is when I was like my bobsledding days, I go to the gym and I'm, you know, squatting big weights and there's all these power lifters and they're all putting these shirts on and doing all this stuff and talking about, <laughs> oh yeah, I bench press 460 and I'm looking at him. He's like, you're 170 pounds. And then I realize, oh, he means with that weird, silly contraption on. Right. So th that barrier to entry, cause I was like, Jay, why don't you power lift? And I'm like, no, that, that looks stupid. Like, you know what I mean? Like knee, even knee wraps to me are dumb. Like I still don't care about knee wraps. When people say how much they squat and they don't qualify with knee wraps after, I'm like, come on, man. Like, let's go. You know, like let's get serious. So when we're looking at that, it's a little bit different because it's like a whole other era. It's just, it's just very, very different back then compared to now. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the five years. Andy, what's your take on this? Um, well, I think specialists are, they're relevant because, but I would say only like the top, top guys are relevant. Like yeah. you take a guy like, uh, his name's Julius Maddox. He's, you know, he attempted to bench 800 pounds. So Was like, that recently? We got a new record, right? We got a well, new he, record. He's done 772 week. before, but he failed 800 and that was like on ESPN and stuff. But, uh, but like someone like him, like, yeah, like that's definitely super impressive. Um, but you have to quantify that by saying like he's a pinch specialist. He's not a true powerlifter because a true powerlifter competes in all three lifts. 
Um, and then, so like, on the other hand, we have this guy named um, Yuri Belkin. He deadlifts over 900 pounds, but he also has an elite squat and a pretty good bench, and he's one of the best powerlifters of all time. I, I was actually very surprised, though, when he competed last, that his squat without knee wraps was only 705. Yeah. I, yeah, I was actually blown away. I thought he was going to squat at least 750. Yeah, because I think he squatted like over nine. I, sorry, over nine, over nine in 100. Yeah, so you got yeah. 200 out of knee wraps. Yeah, wow. It's usually, yeah. I usually just say 100 pounds standard. Yeah, 200 pounds. What the hell? Yeah, that's crazy. crazy. I see the numbers coming up nowadays like raw lifts. The raw lifts are fucking nuts. I don't know if people have like mechanical joints now, but <laughs> what's the secret, Andy? What's the secret to powerlifting now? How do you guys, we're going to talk injuries later too. So what's going on? Like, how are you guys not tearing shit every second day? Uh, I think, Programming? <laughs> I think, okay. I think the, the increase of like the more, more people getting stronger and more bigger numbers is, it's definitely like a bigger pool of athletes to, that are competing now. There's more knowledge, there's more free knowledge, there's more coaches, there's better training, better programming. And then, you know, you have to get athletes who will kind of like are true athletes who take it serious as far as nutrition and supplementation and sleep, and all that stuff. So I think the combination of all that is, is why. And like, then just having a bigger pool of people and the freaks come out, uh, you know, like just a lot of these, you know, there's probably a lot of people who playing football or like, Olympics doing like uh, throwing events, like they could probably come into the sport and, and destroy us. Like you take a, someone like Thor, who's a strong man, you know, he's done like one or two powerlifting meets recently and he, he just has great numbers, but imagine if he focused on that. So I think there's just uh, more people getting into the sport and it's getting more popular with raw. Uh, you know, the, the big explosion was probably five, six years ago. Uh, Jay was, Jay's probably the beginning of that. I was probably in the height of it and well, maybe not the height of it, but, starting to get to the peak of it. I think we're, we're at that peak right now where it's just, there's still more people coming in and there's a lot more women, you know, coming in now. Cause I think it's more acceptable for women to lift and, and be strong and, and, and have muscle. And um, yeah, like I said, it's just more acceptable. So, but I think just combining, uh, you know, proper nutrition and recovery and all that stuff that most athletes, you know, need to do. I think that's probably why there's more uh, bigger numbers and stuff. Makes sense. It's like bodybuilding too. And when you say that about more people jumping into the sport, I think about guys like, and, and, and Joe and Jay could attest because they've seen Ian, well, everybody now has seen Ian Valier push yeah. big lifts. Yeah. I'm wondering how Ian would do as a powerlifter, you know, if he was like geared to be a powerlifter. You look at certain bodybuilders and I don't know, Ian can bench 505 for what four or six reps right yeah he, he would he would easily bench if he trained for it he would easily bench 600 yeah easily yeah easily the question but is, i think it's would his knees handle squatting is the question deadlift he would probably excel at because his back i think his deadlift would be huge yeah he'd done at the least like 750 or whatever you know who would have been really also, great we have to qualify what body weights as well yeah what's that andy uh, someone who been really great, but he unfortunately passed away was Dallas McCarver. Yeah. Yeah. He, he yeah. would lift so heavy. Yeah. Is it a structural thing too, you think? Like a structural, like there are guys that are like really thin jointed, but if you're like, well, not thin jointed, but have, have smaller like insertion points around the insertion points. Do you think guys who are thicker are better power lifters? Uh, there's more surface area. There's more surface area to distribute the weight and more surface area for the weight to be dispersed down the body. So yeah. I think that that def certainly helps. Like if a person's belly is bigger, it helps when they're squatting, for example. Yeah, I, I think there there's in general 99% of the population that more surface area helps. But then like there's some freaks who like, like right now, like, like I said, I mentioned Yuri and then my one of my best friends, workout partner, his name is John Hack. He's a buck 95 and he's yeah. tolling over to almost 2,100 pounds and he's yeah. narrow joints, skinny. That's guy. true. He's the yeah. other guy on Iron Rebel that I've been watching, right? Like yeah. he's, yeah, that guy's impressive too. 
Yeah. He's, he's arguably one of the best power lifters ever. You can yeah. put him up there in that conversation now. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But, but definitely besides the like three over 300 pound guys, the top guys in each weight class, they definitely have way more muscle or leaner. Um, they're not as fat or have big bellies. So I think muscle also <laughs> has, has a, you know, obviously you need muscle to move weight too. Yeah. I remember I met, um, I met a couple of the strong men from the eighties at the Arnold's two years ago. Who was it? Um, and it's funny to see them like, cause they were big kind of fatter guys, right? Strong men, powerlifters back in the day, back in the eighties. And now you're getting like the more streamlined look kind of Jay, you were pretty slim, you know, yourself, like you didn't carry a lot of body fat. No, I, I, I like having abs. It wasn't yeah. until I decided to go into the 242s that I was like, kind of. A little of, softer. Yeah. A little, a little. Jay, I, 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 I'll, let's go into your history too, man, because I completely didn't get into that. And then we'll go back. And yeah, sure. I about- wanted to, to add to what Andy was saying, because he said a lot of good points there. Um, but there's one little thing I wanted to add, which was in addition with the pool getting bigger, and you guys can probably say the same thing to bodybuilding, like Ian Villiers and Chris Bumstead would be examples of this is the uh, entry age into the sport is very different. Like when I was powerlifting, when I started powerlifting, I didn't start till I was 27. Right. I played football. I got out of school. I started bobsledding. So I was doing that training for that for a couple of years, even after I stopped. And then I was thinking weightlifting and then I got into powerlifting. Right. It was much later. So like from like an epigenetic component, if you're trying to turn those switches on and off for like, you know, pure strength, well, I never got, I never did that. Whereas I look at someone like my training partner, Cade Weaver or uh, Jesse Norris, guys, you started when they're like 16. It's like the, the strength just builds, like their body's still adapting and they're focusing on powerlifting. And I think that with the rising popularity of the sport, there's more kids who are jumping into powerlifting much sooner, right? Like there's so many guys, like uh, this one guy, Coach Mark Plummer, freak. It's crazy crazy strong, right? And uh, and he started so young. Like I coached him when he was 17 for Pan Am Games that he won. He's 17 and he's powerlifting. Like when I was 17, I was playing basketball. Like that's not conducive to uh, Mark. Mark was Mark was squatting uh, six hundred pounds and doing backflips at seven. Yeah, in my gym. <laughs> yeah, so I saw him at Newbody the other day. I was, you know, I, I, Joe. I would have invited Mark, but I know you don't like having five squares on this thing. I just, it's not that I don't like having five squares. It's that I just feel like if you have too many people, it's really hard for everybody to actually be talking. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I know. you can definitely have them on. I'm not against having them on. Okay, we'll we'll move Mark to another day. We'll bring we'll bring Jay back. Have Mark have another powerlifting. Yeah, just make it like the Ottawa bodybuilding powerlifting podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Andy, no offense, you're you're oh, awesome cool. to have on, but we don't want to bog you down all the time, man. Yeah. I'm really yeah. I, actually I feel really fortunate to have you on today. I was surprised you even said yes, so I was like, okay, cool, we got him. <laughs> no, actually, uh, you know, I, I used I had a podcast, and I was it was probably going on two years, but ever since. Uh, the pandemic hit, we kind of stopped doing it. And uh, I, I, at that point, I was kind of relieved to not do podcasts anymore because I was doing it every other week. Uh, but yeah. I kind of miss it. I, but now I kind of miss it. I, I, I enjoy talking. It's, it's true because you got a book, you got to get the guests. And it's like, it's, it's so much work, right? On top of everything else you're doing. Yeah, exactly. So I feel you there. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, I haven't had a conversation with three people in a long time, like all at once. <laughs> All at once. <laughs> it's weird, huh? It's like a yeah. fucking party. This is a social event now. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jay, yeah, let's run through your history because we, we missed out on that. Uh, I was basically just looking for something to train. Uh, I, I finished Bob setting. I realized that, you know, going to the Olympics wasn't going to happen. So I was looking for something else and uh, got into weightlifting. But we didn't have camera phones back then. I didn't have someone to watch me train and give me cues. Like there was only one set of bumper weights in the whole city at the time. Uh, like this is pre CrossFit, pre explosion of fitness. That's how old I am. And, uh, and so I needed something else. And I had this one guy at my gym, Willie Albert, who was just always like talking shit to me. He's like, Oh, you think you're so strong? Like, 
Let's see if you can do it on the platform. Da 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 da. And he's just always picking on me. And then uh, one day he's like, yo, there's this new division. It's called Raw. So you got no excuses. So let's go. And then, uh, so I went. Um, I hadn't deadlifted for about eight months going into this meet because I hurt my back really badly. So I didn't even know if I would be able to deadlift. But, uh, but I went in and I did really well. Like there wasn't a lot of competition back then. The only guy who could have given me competition was helping load weights that day, Jerry, Jeremy Hamilton. Um, but so, so I won that. It was at a nationals. It was a, it was like one of the bigger competitions. And then uh, after that, my second competition, I went to Russia for the first Raw World Championships, which had like 800 entrants. It was nuts. And I got yeah. to see Andre Belayev lift, who's Andre Belayev's like, there's this guy, Boris Shako, and he's pretty much like the godfather of powerlifting programming. And uh, this was one of his prodigies. And he was in my weight class and he's just, he totaled 2028 20, at 207 pounds like it was nothing like like every attempt was easy he easily had 20 30 more pounds in the tank on each lift and uh and then from that moment i was like okay the sport's pretty pretty badass that guy was incredible so i competed uh for another five six years uh i've won there's a huge competition or was a huge competition called the raw raw unity meet championships also known rum uh, so that was like one meet to unite them all to see who the strongest was. So I won that a few times and uh, went head to head with guys like Jeremy Hamilton, Sam Bird, Dan Green. Um, and then that meet kind of dwindled. And, and then all these big money meets recently started jumping up. Like the one Andy's going to is like the meet. Like it's one of the big meets. Like Wait, wait, money five, meets... Like, like lots, lots of prize money now. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's getting pretty cool. It's a different sport. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, in that time, I was sponsored by Animal, which was a privilege. I was sponsored by them for seven years. So I got to go to the cage. I went to the cage six years. Um, had a lot of fun in the cage. Like, it's more of watching people as a fan and hanging out with guys. Like, Andy and I hung out, like, all the time in the cage when he was in there. Like, you kind of latch on to certain people and hang out with them. Um, I, I never really felt like I contributed to the cage that much. Cause like I said, I'm like a queen Jack, Jack kind of lifter and everyone else in there is like an ace in some, at least one lift that they perform. So With I always, that freak show lift. Like one like, freak. Yeah, like you saw about Julius Maddox, like the guy benched 700 pounds, you know what I mean? And there's a other, there's like a 600 pound bench, a 500 pound bench press in there is like, Unless you're 165 pounds, like Philip Brewer benching 500, yeah. don't waste your time. <laughs> or, or like Zach Rule, who has no legs, he benched 500. Yeah. Or someone, or someone from the crowd come in and bench 500 pounds. Yeah, but like if you're like a big guy and you bench 500, it's like there, people like they could have might as well have just been someone's warm up. Might as well have been Jeremy Hornstra's <laughs> little warm up, you know. So there's some there's some real crazy things that go on in there. I mean, like, even, like, an 800-pound deadlift, Andy repped it out. I think he did four reps, five reps? Yeah, four. Four reps and nose bleeding everywhere. It was kind of cool. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, the cage is just a different atmosphere. But that's one thing is I never really feel like – it's like, uh, I wish I just had, like, one ace lift that I could have done. But whatever. That makes me feel pretty insignificant, Jay, because, like, my goal was, like, if the RPS was 500 – I was I was head to head with Mark at 450 one year, and then I tore my tricep. Right, so yeah. Well, we've been through more than that, but <laughs> it's um, powerlifting is crazy. You guys are fucking nuts. I don't know how you can manage to do that to your bodies for so long. Because bodybuilders, well, you know what? And I want to talk about this when we talk about injuries. So maybe I won't get into it now. But the difference is, bodybuilders, even Joe, like lifts moderately well with good form. Like, he, he does lift well with good form. He's conscientious about, like, how he lifts. But um, we never really deload. Powerlifters deload. And it, part of your programming, like, you guys really go low. Like, 40% of your weight, right, for a couple weeks or months? No, that's the uh... – so, deload's more popular now, but I would say not everyone deloads or everyone's deload is different. So 
like in my like, and, and everyone's beliefs are different or philosophies are different so like i deload it depends on how elite or how strong the athlete is the stronger and bigger they are the more they need to deload but if you're a 120 pound girl you really don't need to deload that much okay but you're not a 120 pound girl right and neither am i and neither is joe but it, 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 andy let's say you were bodybuilding you, yeah. you used to bodybuild right you tried it yeah I, yeah I, I did for like two three years yeah before, you know, like, what if you were going balls to the wall all the time with your lifts, like heavy, your deload was like, you know, give 20, 30 pounds, give or take. You guys deload a lot more than that. No. Okay. So for, for me, powerlifting wise, the deload comes more with volume. Our volume goes down a lot more. So instead of like five sets of 10, it might go down to like three sets of eight. Uh, the, the intensity might go down, like, it just depends on the lift. And, and so it could go down 10, 20, 30%. That's, that's probably, especially on deadlift, that might go down 30%. It's just based on how, how, uh, how much it affects your nervous system. So it's not really the, the, the poundage that we're trying to like, uh, or not, it's not really your muscles that you're trying to like recover. It's more like your central nervous system. What about your um, joints? Yeah, and, and the joints too. Uh, but like with, with bodybuilding, you kind of deload because some days you don't, you don't always squat for your legs, right? You might just go to leg press more, or like if you're not feeling that day. The, the good thing about bodybuilding is you can always like change exercises uh, to hit a certain body part if, if nothing's feeling great. Um, with powerlifting, I mean, you could do that too, but mostly we deload. That's how we deload. So with bodybuilding, it's just, I guess, you know, you guys kind of switch up. We switch up the exercises more, or we can always go lighter and, and more reps, or you know, just concentrate harder. It's, it's different stimulus. Okay. Well, Joe, Joe's with Patrick. Patrick Tour. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll, I was just gonna like say like what I would do, like and what I would call like a good yeah. deload for myself yeah. is like, uh, like for example, like when I was done my preps for this year, like after the show, like I just uh, like well with Patrick, like he wanted me, you know, typically in a contest prep, I'm gonna train like six days a week, um, and I'm doing a lot more volume, a lot more you know variations of sets like rest, pause, drop sets all that kind of like supersets, more of that, like, you know, higher intensity training uh, versus like after the show, I was just doing like a lot less so. volume, training frequency was less. I'm not like pushing myself to try and like set like any, you know, personal best in the gym. It's more just like doing like straight sets and still training like, you know, harder, but you're not like pushing any extremes. You're just like making sure your body has more time to recover um, before you do start to like push harder again. So it's like, I did that for about, uh, five weeks after my show until like recently, like the last week or two, I started to like ramp things up more again. Yeah. So is that Patrick's technique? He does more like cluster sets and different. Well, pa the way Patrick approaches it, like I can just give you an example of like what he has me doing now. Like he has me, you know, training more for like, not necessarily strength, but to get stronger at the same time because my rep range is lower. Like I'm doing like most of my exercises, like especially for, like the bigger compound lifts i'm doing like six to ten reps on my work sets um and then like as like from what he explained it to me it's like he progressively will implement those things as the off season goes on but he doesn't put it all in at once you know it's like saying some people you know they go back from a deload they might just jump right into doing like you know say cluster sets you know mm -hmm. rest pause drop sets whatever but the way he does it, it's like you know you're going to build your strength up do normal you know, working sets in a lower rep range, build the strength up and then start to implement those other, you know, variables like the cluster sets, like, yeah, you know, as he calls it me metabolic work. Yeah. Metabolic. But so from what Andy's saying, it's a nervous system thing, like to rest your nervous system, which bodybuilders don't get either. I, I uh, can definitely, I, I definitely understand that though. Cause like, even for me, like I, I can just say like this past week, I trained legs, like, well, we trained legs last week, but this week I trained yeah. legs and I think it was even, I pushed myself pretty damn hard. And the next day I literally felt like sick the whole day. Yeah. Cause like yeah. I, my body was just not used to that. And I was sore as hell. And just, you know what I mean? Like I hadn't pushed that hard in like almost two months. So my I'm body glad was to just know like, I wasn't alone, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's, 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 it's kind of like, I feel like it's, there's similarities there, but like, it's just a different goal, you know? Yeah. I feel like, I feel like bodybuilders, have a lot more uh, capacity for volume. There's a lot higher, yeah. a much higher work capacity than, and this is obviously we're talking generals here, uh, but uh, generalities. But I feel like uh, a lot of powerlifters, there's like 
there's there's like a lot of power lifters who are kind of power builders they do their main work and they then they do a lot of down work bodybuilding which is kind of like how i am andy you're kind of like that as well right yeah and then there's some guys who are just like pure power lifters in the sense that they'll like squat bench and deadlift all in the same day four times a week kind of guys so the guys who are doing the you know obviously the more volume the power building they always tend to fill out a little bit nicer and then the other guys tend to just be focused purely on like that cns component like managing their central nervous system and uh but there's also like on top of that powerlifting is like it is full of some of the most intelligent people because the programming is so particular and precise for some people, but it is also full of some of the most like ridiculously nitpicky people. At the pretentious. Same. Yeah. Like, like pretentious. I, 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 I'm not saying that. And like, don't get me wrong. I think powerlifters are great, but I, I agree. Cause powerlifters are meticulous. Like I watch, um, um, what's that channel? What uh, Mike is his name? Mike Isretel? Dr. Yeah. Isretel. Yeah. yeah, he's great. I mean, he's great. Uh, I, I, I don't want to knock him. He doesn't seem like I'm not calling him pretentious. I'm, I'm saying like there's guys that are hyper intelligent about the way they program things, train, even from a bodybuilding perspective. I've been watching his videos to try to build like weak points and, 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 and just, you know, focus my nutrition partitioning around there. Right. So he's got some good recommendations. But then I watch other powerlifters and they just come across kind of pretentious with their with their programming you know what i mean yeah and, and, I, and i think it's kind of ridiculous and I'm, I'm curious what you guys think as bodybuilders but when powerlifters get so caught up in the numbers and there's, there's a little bit of flexibility because you have to be very caught up when you're going into a competition but when you're like 10 or more weeks out from a competition the need to hit you know 85 percent for five reps for five sets and you know, it has to be perfect. Uh, whereas like maybe you go in one day and that second set just doesn't feel right. And maybe you, you feel you should do something else. Uh, a lot of power lifters are kind of like, Oh, I have to do this. And they get really stressed out about that. Um, I think that what that loses sight of is all of the different variables in our lives that can affect that. Like if you're, you're so particular about this exact program and these, how many down sets I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. You have this, whole list of things you're going to do and it has to be perfect for the next you know these five workouts a week for the next 10 weeks and just boom like no fuck ups anywhere right but it's like it's not taking into account like you got in a fight with your girlfriend you know you couldn't sleep last night and i find a lot of people get really stressed out about it and that's where it's neat because you bring up mike israel and uh you think like mike israel and greg Doucette had this big argument over this I don't know, argument, debate, and Greg Doucette's just train harder than you did last time. And they're, they're speaking generally. And Mike Israel's like, no, that's not necessary, right? And uh, it's really interesting because I've found that maintaining my 90, 85, 90% of my strength is extremely easy and requires very little effort. Like how I train right now compared to how I used to train, but I don't, I haven't bench pressed in over a year. And I bet you, if you put a gun to my head, I can still bench press at least 385, 400, which is decent for not doing the lift at all. Right. Right. Cause I said 85%, but I'm talking, I'm not doing benching at all. I just do weighted push ups and dips, but I could probably still squat well over six and deadlift close to 657 if I had a gun to my head and I had to, and that's without really doing the lifts. Um, cause it doesn't take a lot of work to maintain that. So we see a lot of people getting really stressed out about hitting these exact numbers and, you know, and it kind of reminds me of, uh, bodybuilders with calories. Yeah. Right? I was going to say body, it's the same thing. I find bodybuilders are getting more meticulous with the calories, the type of nutrition, you know, like timing. chicken and rice, that kind of thing. And what we I said, and the timing of everything. Yeah, and timing. Joe? 
Cool. I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's also an individual thing, I think for bodybuilders, but I, I'd say for like, well, I can't speak for powerlifting, but I'd probably say it's like a progressive thing because for me, like, you know, when I was like, I guess like an amp before I turned pro whatever. And I was like the first so many years I was into bodybuilding and competing, like, you know, I'd say I took it seriously, but it's like, I feel like as the years have gone on, I've gotten more meticulous with things because like, reference to Patrick again like I was talking to him the other day and I said like yeah like next year I really want to like showcase like big improvements and he's like we're talking about how and I said to him I was like I've never really been extremely structured through an offseason I can admit that like I've always you know not really had a set plan in the offseason in regards to like nutrition it would kind of just be like you know you're eating based on what you feel you need to eat and as much as you think you need to eat and so, so on and so forth so I feel like being that extra meticulous for a bodybuilder is like at a higher level is what separates like guys like, you know, someone like Ian or a James Hollingshead, who's like, you know, really made that extra step from like being meticulous throughout the whole year with their food and, you know, supplements and training and everything versus like a guy who's like, you know, they go all out in contest prep for a show, but the rest of the year, they're kind of like, you know, you know, not saying they're not, not they're half-assing it, but they're not. They're playing it by year. They're no. playing it by ear. They're not. Yeah. As, I, I, I'm actually beginning to agree with Joe. It's just quantifying things. But Jay's right too. I think you know what we need is a happy medium. We need a happy yeah. medium between the two. Like, I, I don't like for bodybuilding. I don't like quantification because bodybuilding is an aesthetic sport. Like, you want to look at your body. You want to see if it's good. Like fucking calculating every set. Every I, I see people in the gym with their notepads, and it drives me nuts. Jay knows me. I'm more like a, I'm not very uh, objective when it comes to things. Like I don't like being objective. It, it it drives me nuts. You know, I'm not detail oriented. If I was, then I'd probably be better at what I did. But it takes the art out of it. But at powerlifting, you need that a little bit, right? You need the structure. Because how are you going to get stronger? So happy medium. But bodybuilders are like that too, Jay. I agree with the diet. Maybe some of them with the lifting, because now Patrick, to speak, Joe might, must know, because Patrick is getting them to do um, a very specific type of training. He, he calls, um, Jesus Christ, what's it called? Uh, sarcoplasmic uh, SS, hypertrophy. SST. SST, yeah. So it's, it's, he, he, his theory is that the, the sarcoplasm in the muscle um, kind of expands the muscle cells. So the training is very important. So you got to train heavy. You've got to you've got to feed your body so that you can train heavy, so you can make that extra growth. And from his clients, I've I've seen it. Like I, I see it firsthand. I've seen it with his amateurs, and I haven't seen you know Joe uh, by the end of the season because he just started with him. But James, a full season with him, looks totally different. Ian's grown, but which is hard to believe how much can fucking Ian grow anymore. But he's growing. So, uh, anyways, I, I I'll shut up with that. But I agree. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to rant. I want to ask about that. So, do you guys think? Also, obviously, it's like independent on the the, the bodybuilder or powerlifter. But uh, like, because like, I would say I would like, like, who was it? Uh, Trevor Lebron. Like, he never took his off season serious, right? He would like shrink down, be total natural, and just play music. And then when it was time to like yeah. prep, you would just, you know, turn it on. Here's the question. Then, yeah. And Go then ahead. there's people like, also like Jay Cutler and Ronnie, I, I don't think their training was very complicated. It was very much just straight sets and doing the same fucking thing every day. Um, so I think a lot of bodybuilders don't quote unquote know how to train to uh, grow muscle. They just kind of just are naturally gifted to grow uh, just by training and eating. And then, but now with people like uh, Pretor, like he knows how to train and how to, you know, force muscles to grow. So I think that that information is getting out there and that's why you see the better results. Yeah. Yeah. Bang, bang on, man. I think you're, you're bang on there. I think that's exact. Because Kevin LeVone had great genetics, but could have Kevin LeVone been Mr. Olympia? Probably. Right. Yeah. He probably could have superseded everything that Ronnie Coleman did within a year. You know what, I, I mean, speculatively, like that's just a, a spec, I mean, I'm, I'm just speaking hypothetically, but I think so. And Ronnie Coleman, he didn't need to know how to train because he trained like, 
even Patrick Tour was when he we had him on the podcast, he was saying the same thing. Like Ronnie was Ronnie. No one else will ever be able to lift that sort of poundage and eat well, fucking Ronnie, barbecue yeah, sauce. Like, He's he's literally just like he doesn't count because like yeah. he's such a genetic anomaly when it comes to building wow. muscle that like he it didn't matter what he does he was gonna grow you know like it's like versus like someone like myself like I don't have anywhere near that type of you know I'm a bigger bodybuilder but I'm not on the level of Ronnie Coleman by any means so it's like for me it's like I need to take advantage of any extra things I can do training wise nutrition wise and i'm really beginning to realize that more and more now that it's like if i really want to be competitive as a pro i need to do all those extra things year round or i'm not going to be competitive as a pro and i think like for me this year seeing how i placed like regardless of what people you know your friends want to say when it comes to like you know um you getting overlooked or you know you should have placed higher this and that it's like yeah you could be right but at the same time i'm not going to sit there and be like oh i just got overlooked i'm going to do the same shit again I'm going to go back to the drawing board and do more, do things better, you know, because yeah. at yeah. the end of the day, it's like, if you just do the same thing again, you'll get the same result. So. That's an amateur bodybuilding attitude for sure. That's what I would do. I mean, oh, yeah, oh, they'll I, say I, like, I oh, it was so I'm just going to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to do the same thing next off season, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there are people stuck in ruts and powerlifting like that too. I think you got to be um, comfortable with change. Um, since we're talking about pros, you guys want to talk about what it takes to be like an elite pro powerlifter? I know that was on our list of things I was Genetic. thinking of talking about. That's it. <laughs> that is... 98% genetics. Yeah. Do you think genetics so? Is, yeah. Like strength, strength is one of the slowest gainers for people. Like everyone has that initial newbie spike, right? Like this curve that everyone has or think for you guys the other way, right? Diminishing returns over time. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Right? But I mean like that where like the height of your curve is very different. Like some people have a curve that's like down here. They could train perfectly and when they get to the top of their potential, they're here. And then someone might just be here. So they they start above. Like it's just it's like remember in gym class there's like those poor kids who couldn't even do one chin up. And you're like looking at them like how can this kid not do a chin up? Like you know what I mean? And some of that, like, I'm assuming all you guys, when you were kids, were able to do it. But, like, yeah. I could do, like, 10 chin-ups when I was, like, five years old. So when some other person was, like, hanging and they can't even pull themselves up, I'm, like, not, not making fun of them. Like, actually, like, I can't comprehend what that is like. You know what I mean? And that's that's pure genetic, a genetic thing. Like, we could argue the, the epigenetic component. Like, maybe it's because that kid's parents – had him in front of a TV the whole time. And you know what I mean? But yeah, I think epigenetics play a big factor. It's like you mentioned before, those who started, Joe started earlier. I don't know about Andy. Andy, you're, you're fairly young, aren't you? No, I'm fairly old. I started, so I'm 36 right now. And I started when I was 31. So I got into this. Asian. Point. Yeah. He's Asian. He looks, Asian. looks like he's 18. Yeah. He's Asian. Yeah, I, he's Asian. I, I can say shit like that. No. Yeah. I thought you said he was ancient. I'm like, no, that's not, that's not that old, man. It could be worse. It could be us, Jay. Yeah. Actually, you're younger than me. Fuck. You got, you got me all beat. You did, you did get into powerlifting very late then. Yeah, I did. Because like, you yeah. played football in college, right? Played football. And then um, for a while, just kind of like personal training and just kind of lifting like a half meathead, half, uh, half football player, half bodybuilder. Then I did uh, bodybuilding. From like 28 to 30, 31, and then I got into powerlifting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you were, okay. So if you would have started earlier though, do you think it would have made a big difference? Yes and no. Uh, I think, okay. I think if I would have started bodybuilding earlier and then went into powerlifting, I would have been a lot better. So I think, I think the best body, my best powerlifter would, is like a good bodybuilder too, or has the, uh, the ability to put on size and muscle. Yeah. Um, so I think if I had like, instead of two, three years of bodybuilding, if I had like five, six years of bodybuilding and then got into powerlifting and I was maybe 28, I think that would have been like the perfect, like, okay. um, I feel like now I'm, I'm, I got in a little late and I've been squatting since I was 15. So I've already had like 15 years of just squatting 
I, I, I've always squatted. So I think like my knees and my back is just, it's kind of wearing down now. Uh, Cause like I said, my first two, three years, or my first two years, I, I, my numbers went up so high. Now I'm fighting for fucking five pounds on, on each lift. So, and I'm getting more injured more. And it's not like I don't know how to like prevent injury. It's just the, just the way my body's breaking down now. So I think yeah, if I everything, think... if everything started maybe three, four five years earlier, I would think I'd be at a better position. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I think everyone's different. Um, it's, it's, you know, back to genetics and like people like Larry wheels who started when he was like 18. Uh, you know, he's just, he's just a freak. Larry's a kid though. Larry's what? 20, 26 or 25. He's probably at yeah, 25, 26 now. Yeah, but when he was like 18, 19, he was still benching like five, six, like he might've, he had a friend holding the bar or whatever, but he was benching like five sixty or something like, yeah. Like he, he could still bench well over 500 with close grip, super long arms, you know, like he's, yeah, he's like six foot. Yeah. Insane, yeah. insane strength on that guy. His tendons are just nutty. Yeah. Well, that's the thing though. He's young, you know, we all know all three of us, Joe, Joe's still too young, but I, I, he, I don't knock on wood, Joe, but once you get 30 to 36, I don't know, man. Joints start getting a little, Jenny would agree, I'm sure. Joints, yeah. knees, other things, like it just, your body starts breaking down. You know where most of my injuries happened? It was when I opened up my CrossFit gym. I got, most of my injuries happened spotting people or demonstrating things cold. Literally, like, oh, yeah. this, this is how you do a kipping pull up. And I just jump up, but I'm 230 something pounds and I should have warmed up a little bit. So my lat got a little sore or I'm spotting someone who's squatting maybe 275 and they're like, oh, Jay's strong. So they dump it behind them. <laughs> I, I reflex <laughs> to catch the weight. And then my, then I injure something here. You're like, like you fucker. Yeah. yeah you know, recently I was training in a gym, like this small kind of studio gym that had hammer strength and all this equipment, but it was this guy's place. So it was so small that they had everything condensed. Right. So I, you know, I tore this tricep and I had surgery. I tripped on a bench, fell backwards on a whole bunch of weights. And I, I'm pretty sure it might be a full or a partial, but like I was bruised up everywhere. I mean, it's, I think this tricep's gone now, but I've been working through it. Like, I don't want the surgery again. But, I mean, it wasn't lifting. What really pisses me off is this one finally recovered. I was doing 140-pound dumbbells again, and then now it's this one, and I can't even. I think, well, maybe I can go back to powerlifting and, and, and just do that occasionally instead of bodybuilding. Because bodybuilding is hard. Like, it's hard on your body, too. So I'm like, you know, let's switch it up. Fucking tear another thing doing nothing, you know, tripping on somebody's bench. It's a piss off because it never happens when you're lifting weight. You're right. It never happens when you're uh, a couple guys when they're benching, you see that during meets and that's really scary when I see those meat injuries. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, one thing that really like kind of changed how I look at it is getting ready for one of my meets. So it was like two weeks out from a meet and I had just squatted, I think like, 700 for a double or triple in training and i was really tight two days later and it was cold it was the winter it was like minus 35 out and i was getting up to do a to coach one of the morning classes it was freezing and on the driveway there was a patch of ice and so my body's stiff because one it's morning it's cold and two i just lifted a lot of weight the day before, uh, a couple days before and i slipped on the ice so my right leg shoots forward and my left leg kind of stabilizes, right? Oh, shit. But the, the like torque, like the angle that my knee was at, it really hurt my knee. And I like screamed. I was like, ah, and I like thought I wouldn't be able to walk. But then after like two minutes of just sitting on the ice like an idiot in the dark, cold morning, uh, the pain started to go away and I got up and I was able to walk to the car and it wasn't that bad. But I was pissed off that I had hurt myself. I'm like, oh, I'm messing up my training uh, because of or this competition because I hurt myself. But then later on, I started thinking, and I'm like, no, 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 no. You hurt yourself. You hurt yourself because of your training. Because when I was bobsledding and I could jump 
on anything under my chin and I could sprint super fast and I was bouncy, that wouldn't have meant anything. That would have just boop, boop, and I would have been fine. Right. And then I was like, it's like, yeah, it's the training. It's how tight my muscles are now that makes me susceptible to injury. Yeah. You find that Andy? Yeah, I think so. But also like, like, like you said, you're after a workout like that, you're, you're very stiff and obviously we should, you know, stretch more, warm up more, all that stuff. Um, but I mean, I, I, I can't, me personally, I get hurt lifting. Uh, so my, my more, my two significant injuries were done lifting. So I'm a little different. Um, I will say like probably when I first started, I would always get in the gym. I would just immediately start squatting, just put on plate on two, two plates, three plates. But now it's like fucking 45 minute warm up just to like feel like I'm ready to squat yeah. stuff like that. And then the next, I think, I think also what I neglect is the days off or the days in between the bigger lifts. I don't focus on that as much. I don't get as prepared as well versus just like the day of. So I think that's something we, we uh, could all improve on. Yeah. And, and that, that's why I stopped powerlifting is, uh, is uh, I had a kid and time became scarce all of a sudden. Yeah. And I realized I can't take 45 minutes to an hour to warm up for my squats to work because I have torn labrum in my hip. And uh, I can't take all this time and have these two and a half, three hour sessions anymore. Yeah. It, just, it just doesn't work. It's too impractical. So I'm yeah. kind of thinking maybe in a year or two, uh, depending on what happens in the world, I'll probably get back into lifting. And it all depends on if I can warm up in less than 10 minutes. If I can't <laughs> warm up in less than 10, 15 minutes to squat, I don't yeah. deserve to squat. That's kind of how I'm going to treat it. Yeah, yeah, you're working against time, man. Don't wait. <laughs> yeah. um, we get yeah, inspired no, I... by some guys like Stan, Stan Efferding, right? Yeah. yeah. He, he took so much time off, just focused on business and his life. And then he came back in his forties. Right? Yeah, it's true. It probably takes it, more than 10 minutes to warm up, but you know what I mean? But Stan's always been, you know, he's always been in good shape and he's always done something. So it's, it's good for him. He's a real inspiring type of guy. Um, but yeah, I feel the same way about the, that warming up and the older you get, the more you time you need. And now you got to book the gyms in, in, I don't know about California. Are they doing that over there, Andy? Yeah. You got to book have, your gym time. Yeah. We have to book gym slots. Yeah. I was thinking about it. Everything's a fucking appointment nowadays. <laughs> oh, uh, but not yeah, you gotta, I go there, but so, well, yeah, not new body, but still, you know, I book, I, I just book every day, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm that asshole. And you then, book four hours? <laughs> well, yeah, but I go when I want. Like I go when yeah. I can. I, I work. I have busy. I got yeah, shit yeah. to do. That makes sense. Sorry, guys. I'm gonna book those <laughs> slots. I need to get my work. And like Jay said, I'm an old man. I gotta fucking warm up and do my thing. So um, on the injury front, like Andy, what are you dealing with? Uh, currently, I'm knock on wood injury free right now, um, but I've uh, I've torn my quad, I've torn my ACL, MCL, I tore my adductor and growing. I've I've like tore or strained my pecs like multiple times. I think that's just something every powerlifter goes through the the, the pec thing. Um, I think that's far. That's that's about it as far as like actual like significant injuries. But no matter what, I always have like elbow, tricep issues. My back's always sore. We're hurting, so always trying to like work around that. Yeah, yeah. powerlifting is a painful sport. Yeah. yeah, like you're always tight. You're always sore, or I was anyways. Um, and it wasn't until I stopped that I was like, oh, this is how like. You're supposed to feel this is how normal people feel <laughs> yeah i always I can, feel I can, pain in my back i can get up and down off the ground right now and play with my kid and not have to like you know take a deep breath or feel my blood pressure go through my go through the roof so yeah i i can kind of relate to what indy was saying like not taking enough time between like when i do the rps meets First, I do a bodybuilding show, and then I think I was training at Dynamo with you, Jay, and you told me to go down to, like, two plates and, like, do a pause rep. I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do with two plates? Like, that, that's easy. So I would always max out every, pretty much every day. 
And I think that that was like the demise of my triceps. Like I would always have tendon, tendonitis and I'd just ride it out. I'd go to the meet and I'd be like, you know, ibuprofen six or seven. And then I'd do the, uh, then perform the lift and get out of there and then, you know, have joint pain for another year. But I think it, eventually it, 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 it just, those joints deteriorate. When I did my ultrasound, they, they, they saw a whole bunch of scar tissue. They're like, the guy doing the ultrasound asked me how many surgeries I had. So obviously it was pretty messed up. So Andy, you're probably, you know, your tendons and stuff have taken some damage, I would assume. Yeah, I'm sure they have. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I honestly, just, just based on like past injuries and how hard it is to like make progress now, I probably realistically have like a year or two at this level and I'm like okay with it. If at the end of the day, like I'm like behind Stan Efforting and Larry Wheels, like that's something I can like, you know, uh, live with. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like I'm so close to like having like, if I have like a good year of like no injuries that like I have the potential to like maybe get closer to the record or if not break it. So I is the next year or two for me is like, I think just very kind of like the last, last hurrah for me. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm also like nervous and scared about it, but I think at the end of the day, you know, I can look back and be okay with it. Um, so I, I don't know how like Jay, you feel. Uh, I mean, I think just hearing you say you might come back, so like that makes me feel like okay, I could probably just take a few years off and a few years off and come back. But I'm also afraid there'd be like new freaks coming in and just setting the bar even higher. Oh, like that, that's the thing, man. Like if I come back, it's like you know, there is one point where I was ranked number one at 220 in the world, and yeah. I think if I look at the all-time list now, I'm like 100th. <laughs> no, but like I'm probably yeah. like. 15 up, up 25 or something i have no idea i haven't yeah, looked yeah. in a while i should look but uh um but I, it's just like you just gotta kind of let that go it's like it's not it's not important really yeah it's just obviously see if you can get better i mean there's a time when i wanted the squat record which was 780 780 by sam bird yeah and then Dan got 783 and then jordan wong got 785 and uh and like I had that kind of like on my mind, but that now it's like eight something. It's like, okay, this is getting ridiculous. Like, no, yeah. that, that won't happen when I'm pushing 40 because I'm going to be 40 in, you know, three years, two, two, three years. So but I it, don't see that happening. Jay, it's, it's relative, right? Because there, there are masters in 40 year old classes, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, it's relative. I mean, we don't care about those. Those don't care. <laughs> that's that's like Joe. I'm talking about getting like I'm like we're gonna go to North Americans and I'm gonna get one of those pro cards that they give out like because they give out uh, every division gives out like two and I'm gonna compete in the 40 year old division, which is ab actually I don't want to say I don't want to offend anyone, but if, t for me if I got a pro card, you know, in that division, I that would be my goal. But it just it doesn't mean I'd be standing with Joe ever in my lifetime not even a semblance of it. You know what I mean? So I don't want to offend anyone by, by, by saying that if you get your pro card in that class, but it's just not as relevant, right? But still, if you were like one of the best in the world at one point, and then you competed as a 40 year old in that division, you're the best in the world at that point, then it's different. It's like the Masters Olympia that doesn't happen anymore. But power, I, I guess you guys don't see the analogy, right? Yeah, I think, I you think see what I'm saying? I think one of the things is like when, when I got into powerlifting, so if I take the guys that I competed against at rum, okay. Like the other guys who are really good, Sam bird, uh, Dan green, Jeremy Hamilton. Okay. There's the four of us for like three years, head to head. We all talk to each other on Facebook over the phone, like chirping Facebook. each other. Dan's always calling me skinny, but, uh, we're all the kind of guys who we would be training. Like we were training before Instagram. You know what I mean? Like we're training in a basement by ourselves before Instagram, like yeah. whether or not the sport exists, we're training in a gym or in a, in a basement, in a dungeon, in a garage where no one's looking. We're not looking for praise. We just love training. And I think now that that is one little piece the social media has changed the game because now a lot of people 
do need that external validation a little bit more. And like, I'm talking in generalizations, I'm not yeah. saying one, but there's just like, it's obviously like everyone posts their training every single day. It's like, they want people to see it and like it. Like I, since I, since I, uh, like lost my sponsorship with animal, like I stopped, I don't even care to post my training anymore. And, uh, and like people ask me, are you still training? And it's like, hell yeah, I train every single day. And I probably still train harder than 95% of the people. I'm just not being super particular, but I'm still working hard. And, you know, so it's, uh, that, that's one thing that I think is very, very different. So when I talk about getting back into powerlifting, it's like, if I get back, it'll be because I want to lift heavy again. I want to, it doesn't hurt me when what was happening was I'm sitting here and I'm like, Oh, like I identify to so many people. They know me as a power lifter. It's good for my business to be a big, strong power lifter, you know? So if I keep doing more, we'll get more online clients, this, that, and the other, but it's like, now it's like, eh, it's not really that important. So I'll train the way I want to train now. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so that's why coming in first, getting world records isn't as important to me. I'm not attached to it at all anymore. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm like halfway there. Like, I'm still attached to it because I know I'm capable of it. And I still want to post because it does help me with my business and everything. It helps with your business. But, and everything. but if at the end of the day, like everything went away tomorrow, I would be okay. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm there with you too, Jay. And you're, you're also at a point, like you're at a point now where, uh, the amount, the, the trade-offs aren't crazy for me the, no. like, the amount of work I had to do just to lift right. was crazy. And you're also like within arm's reach yeah. of everything. Right. So yeah. the carrots right in front of you still. Yeah, definitely. You want to hit the, is Larry wheels your primary competition then for this meet? Uh, there like there's okay. How do I not sound <laughs> arrogant? Um, the, the three people ahead of me are Larry Wheels, who doesn't powerlift currently, or, or if he, you know, I, I don't know what he's doing, but he's not like in powerlifting right now. Yeah. Uh, and then this guy named Dennis Cornelius, who's actually a all natural athlete, and he's has been kind of on the downslide, uh, but he still has a higher total than me. And then Stan Efforting, uh, which he's not competing anymore. So, uh, and then like people below me, there's some people close to me, but um, as far as like who I compete against, it's, I, I compete against myself, obviously, but I, I'm chasing these numbers. Yeah. So I don't like my competition. Like I said, is is more what what my numbers are. Um, True. But I will say, like that's something in, in the sport right now. Uh, like, uh, you, it's kind of like a body, like in bodybuilding, where some pros pick certain shows because they know like it'll be a like a second tier show. You know what I'm saying? Um, so there's a lot of uh, powerlifters who do smaller meets because there's no competition and they have, they don't have to travel. They have like their friends judging. So it's like a easier, like overall meet to do. Cause it's like, it's in their backyard and, and a lot less stress on them. And they set these big numbers, but they'll never go to like a bigger money meet where like more top lifters are. And they don't have to have that, that competition aspect where they're going head to head and they have to like beat this other person. Um, yeah. Just like like you like the bodybuilding like you know at the end of the day if they make the Olympia that they're, they're gonna get exposed or quote unquote exposed but um, so I think that's kind of missing in powerlifting uh, there's just not one big Olympia quote unquote to make everybody have to compete against each other um, so th so p there's people who can just set these numbers like in their own like comfortable setting I think that works because it is objective. But for Joe, like Joe's a new pro and he can attest to this. He picked some pretty big shows this year. Yeah. Like you had some hefty competition, some good guys uh, you competed against in these shows. So they were fairly competitive. It was a fairly competitive season because of the pandemic. Right. So pretty much everybody, the shows were condensed. Like you didn't really have a choice this year. But I think Joe, I don't know what you guys have planned. out. You, you know, if you're going to pick top tier shows next year, like the New York Pro or you did the Cali Pro, which is a huge show. Yeah, like um, I'm not 100% sure what shows I'll do per se, but I'd like to start, uh, you know, start to do a show like my first couple of shows probably in like June or July um, and shoot for like the summer kind of to start to do shows. So 
you know, just to, it kind of, yeah, like it is sort of hard to say for sure, like what shows I'll pick, but I'd love to do the shows that are in, you know, the ones in Canada, like the upcoming year, because, you know, as long as those are still going to be on, like I would definitely like to do like the Toronto pro and Vancouver pro. Cause you know, it's easier in a sense to just travel within Canada and do a couple shows than have to go to the States. Cause like this year, you know, going to the States, then coming back, you have to quarantine for two weeks and all that stuff. So it wasn't, it wasn't like practical or ideal to come back and have to do that for two weeks after a show, if you want to keep prepping. So, um, you know, doing that, like, that's the only reason, that's why I only did two shows too, because it was, uh, wasn't easy to come back and quarantine for two weeks and trying to, you know, stay on point with everything with like not having your usual access to everything. Right. So. Yeah. And to Andy's point, I mean, it, that, that does make sense. Shows are a little bit, you know, uh, there's more competition in the IFBB pro shows than I guess in powerlifting because there's so many different federations. You're just putting numbers up and then competing against those numbers. Yeah. So it's not like you pick a show. Well, you were saying some guys will pick shows because they're like it's a second tier show. That's like well, guys yeah. who go to Poland or something. And like guys will do that. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, in bodybuilding too. Like there's obviously like there's the tier one, which is like, you know, like your Olympia, your Arnold, uh, Arnold, Ohio. New and then, York. I'd uh, say New York. New York. That's well, that's tier two. Um, New York, like New York pro is tier two. Um, then like Toronto pro. And there's a few other in tier two. And then, uh, but most of the other shows like, you know, like Cali pro and such are more like tier threes. Um, but, uh, yeah, you like, you'll see a lot more guys trying to pick like certain shows. Like for example, if there's shows at the end of the year, like there was this year and like, you know, not saying that like Romania or any of those shows weren't like, you know, good lineups or whatever, but it's like, you'd have a better opportunity going to one of those shows if you can get there because like, it's not going to be as many guys going to those shows as there would be say going to like, you know, the Chicago pro or, you know, one of those shows where it's like a little more central for a lot of people to get towards. So that's why, like, you know, you look at the, when I did the Chicago pro, I think there's 23 guys in the open uh, doing Chicago, which is quite a bit for, you know, compared to what the shows are usually like, I would say. Um, and then you go to a show like, you know, say Romania or one of those other shows where it's like, you know, there might only be like 10 guys or less, you know, in the lineup. So it's like, you know, it's a, it's a toss up though. Cause you never know how many guys are going to enter a show. So like, you could pick any show and just, it could just be lucky that you ended up in a lineup that, uh, you know, there was less guys and whatever. But uh, I personally, I don't really, I don't pick the show based on, I think it's going to be easier. I just, I'd pick it based on like what I'm, my, my strategy is, I guess, in regards to what I'm trying to accomplish. So it's like, if you're trying to qualify for the Olympia, you probably want to pick shows a little bit closer to the Olympia so you can just continue prepping into the Olympia. And I'm sure it'd probably be the same um, for powerlifting. If like, you know, you're probably going to pick a, pick meets based on what's like going to be best for your training convenient convenient to their cycle like yeah. to their not not their like their, their, their uh, what do you call that program yes. right cycle programming, cycle two. Cycle two. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> programming. <laughs> i've heard power lifters this is a totally different topic and i won't i won't i won't go on it today but i've heard power lifters say crazier shit than bodybuilders that's all i know and i'm gonna leave it at that no it's Powerlifters take fewer compounds and they just go higher doses. Yeah, Bodybuilders I, I, take more compounds, like more different compounds. It's more of a, yeah. like a recipe there. Well, it's so, true because we need <laughs> to manipulate like our looks with different things, but you guys, it's, it's sheer strength. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of people who just take a, a handful of this handful of that, whatever. Yeah. You guys want to <laughs> no, be I, pretty. No, I think, I think that's more of an old school mentality. Like back in the eighties and nineties, guys would just take a handful of b-ball and just fucking go for it but <laughs> and i i'm sure jay, jay knows some quantities quantities that people have been taking but um but i would say for the most part uh it, we we kind of take all the take the same stuff and there's just kind of like these the bro science of how much to take i think it i don't think there's that many um i think overall like 99 percent of people don't take that much extreme but there are those who are obviously will like any other sport go to the extreme for it yeah i yeah. think you guys I, I think bodybuilding and powerlifting are the same it's genetics and the person with the best genetics can actually make use of less and do better same thing same thing i, yeah. I actually have a question for you guys because like and i'm curious even andy in california how different it is because one of the things we had was how like 
powerlifting, how has it changed in the last five years? And I'm curious, if I think of when I started powerlifting, so let's say instead of five years, we say seven, eight years, um, the type of person who powerlifted when I started was, like I was saying, we trained by ourselves or in a, in a rack in a dirty gym in old clothes because we don't want to ruin our good clothes. And we're usually people who aren't starting until later in life because we're getting over other sports. So it's athletes looking for a new sport. And now it seems like there's a huge, and obviously I'm not speaking for anyone, but with the big growth of the sport of powerlifting, it seems like a lot of the people are younger and it's like a different breed. It's like people who expect to have a rack to themselves. They get dressed up to train. They wear the newest outfit, you know, and it's different. Like some of us do it like Andy will wear new stuff because he's promoting his brand. I always wore animal because I was support, like supporting the brand. But before that, it was just like, yeah. here's a shirt that I don't care if it gets ruined. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm going to wear that yeah. comfortable. I had, I had these one, this one pair of sweatpants that had like holes all yeah. over them. And I would wear those to warm up every time I train. And I feel like the sport has kind of changed in that. And at the same time, one thing I've noticed with Canadian powerlifting is it's, seems to have attracted a much, and I don't mean this as an insult, but a much softer population. Um, like a, the, the self-help, the self-improvement side of people. So like there's the people who are the athletes that just absolutely want to get better, but there's this huge class of people who kind of got into powerlifting because they needed something to help them, to organize them. You know what I mean? And, and it's like this, uh, I just noticed there's a big like mental health component in powerlifting in Canada. Anyways, I've had one guy who owns a big brand, a uh, very popular brand in Canada. It's popular in the States as well, but we were talking about putting my journal on his, uh, on his site and his store and everything. And he, one of the things he said is like, he's like all powerlifters, you know, are messed up in the head and they all have, they all have problems. And he's a younger guy. And, and I kind of took offense to it because I'm like, I, I, I was kind of like, no, like, not all. Like, I, I never noticed that with any of them or any of my friends. Like, we're all pretty good. Like, you know, but I, I thought it was a weird generalization. And ever since he said that, I've kind of noticed, oh, yeah, like, the younger generation, when you look at their posts, they're always talking about going through a really tough time in their life. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just really there. So I wonder if it's the same thing in California. Do you find that there's a huge like draw attraction from people who are trying to get some sort of anchor in their life as opposed to just people who want to lift weights? You know, do you find that Andy? Um, well, I think we have to first realize that like because of social media, we only pay attention to what we see. So like if you follow power of who post, we're, we're, we're forgetting about the, those who don't post. So I don't know how many that, how many don't post about that kind of stuff. Um, but I think because I, I think, I think it does seem more like more common that people are able to like express their feelings. Um, but also I don't know if people just, do it to be trendy because i think I, I think that is a trend you really see it more people talk about you know uh, their feelings and all that stuff but but also i mean i, I feel that like it, <laughs> all, all that stuff eh? like geez. yeah a lot of it like but oh motivated you're not always motivated well like but, but for us i us to really take it serious it, i think number one we come from a lot of us come from sports backgrounds and we know what it's like to like go through hard times and and just but but regardless you just do the do what do the work like having being part of a team sport or having coaches like you, you you're you're just kind of like just push through things and just do things um and now they have to like have some kind of like reinforcement or like praise like you said earlier um or recognition that like oh oh you're struggling it's okay uh, we acknowledge you good job um but I don't know. It's, it's hard to say because, like I said, it, it could just because we see it more. It's, so, it's on social media, so it's more out there. 
versus like a lot of people who just kept it in and didn't like post it online and or, and, and whatever you know so yeah I don't, I'd, uh, I don't know like I think just from the bodybuilding world's perspective like what I see is a lot of people just think like they're entitled to certain things you know and I feel like from what I've seen like there's a lot of people like I'll get clients for example like they'll come to me and like I've had it in the past where you know they'll see me to be like yeah like I want to look like you in a year and I'm like <laughs> huh I'm like, like what and then like you can tell like I can tell like from you know I'm not bashing people by any means but it's like yeah some people you can tell like they're like inst I, what i would call like an instagram bodybuilder where it's like they're doing it for social media not because they genuinely love to do it you know yeah. versus like myself like when i started competing and you know, i started competing in 2012 and like i had been training before that so it's like i've been doing this for over a decade and i'm 28 years old so like for me like i was i got into it because like i genuinely like doing it the only reason i got into like the social media side was because like oh it can help me like you know be more marketable as an athlete or as a coach or this and that. And like, that's why I use it. But I, I get sick of social media just cause like you see so much of the same stuff every day, like people posting that. And I'm like, you know, I'm not saying anybody shouldn't post about their feelings. If you want to post about your feelings, go for it. But it's like, some of it's a little bit, uh, a little bit much I find, but uh, that's, that's my perspective of just seeing people think they're entitled to like, you know, um, being a certain level, like they don't respect like the, the people who have been doing this for so long, they kind of think like, oh, I can just, I can get there. Like, you know, they don't factor in genetics or anything else. They're just kind of, they have that entitlement from like having all this like technology and social media that they've been growing up with versus like, maybe not even me because I'm, you guys are a little bit older than me, but even for you guys, like you could probably see it more so because, you know, from when you guys were starting to till now, like there's been even more of a change in like the technology and social media than even for myself. So. I think the answer is almost twofold because it's, 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 it's odd because there's, you know, the, the generational changes are huge and social media exacerbated that. So people who are born generation Z or Y or whatever the fuck they are now, they are from a soft, I don't want Jay, I, I don't want to use your words, but I agree. It's, it's a softer, you know, generation. It's, it's, it's a different generation. It's a PC generation. It's the cancel culture, everything there. Like people have changed, society's changed. And then on top of that, what's exacerbating it, it's a social media. Because I grew up, before, I'm, I'm the oldest one here. And if you looked at all our social medias, I'm probably the worst. So I'm the most like a 20 year old begging for attention on my Instagram. You know what I mean? <laughs> But if I, had, if I had shoulders like yours, I'd be posting them. <laughs> yeah. And the selfies. But the, 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 irony, the irony is, like, it's almost a fucking joke to me because when I was 20, when I was 16, when I started lifting weight, there was no cell phones. Like, I mean, we didn't even, my phone was this big, you know? Like, I can get a picture on that. And we would just train. And when I went to university, it was the same thing. We would train to train. And it was weird. I remember being in high school and being like, who's that guy training at lunch? That's fucking weird. Why is he not drinking with us tonight or partying with girls? You know what, what I mean, you know? And I think um, the whole culture has changed in the sense that now people see this as the thing to do. Whereas our generation, it was like, let's go lift weights. And there is an element of insecurity, I think, to everybody who jumps in a gym. Maybe not athletes, because you guys are different. You come from an athletic background and you're looking for a transition. Because I had this conversation with someone before, and I think athletes are a little bit different. But other people who jump into the gym who weren't former athletes, we're going there to get bigger, stronger, to improve on ourselves. You don't yeah. see Jay, no, you no, I, I'm, agree I'm agreeing with you completely, okay. and I'm actually I'm actually saying every single dude who steps in a gym isn't thinking i don't want to get bigger because i don't want to get yeah. too bulky every single one of us wants to look more manly like. and, and we have our insecurities about that there's no fucking doubt but yeah. um vocalizing it is and, and the way kids approach things it's just it's it's like joe said i agree with everyone here on this panel because like joe is saying it's an entitlement thing and i think it is because i get dms from young people and they're like how do you motivate yourself to go to the gym and for me it's like how do I not go to the gym without wanting to like 
jump off the, the, the roof, you know? Like, if I don't go to the gym, I'm going nuts. So yeah, I think it's a different generation. It's just, it, this is our bread and butter. We were brought up, this comes first before the social media. For them, the social media comes first. And it's hard to wrap your mind around it. Like, even though the social media and that, that intrinsic motivation, like you're born with it, you go to the gym because you love it. That's something we have but it's something the new generation I don't think always does. Yeah. I, 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 I like to rephrase it from loving the gym to, it's not that I love training. It's I hate not training. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's like habit, a neurosis. The habit is so ingrained that like to yeah. not do it, like gives me this OCD feeling. Oh, I haven't trained in two days. I have to train right now. I can't take two days off. Like, no. I have yeah. To train. Physically. I feel it. I feel it in my bones. If I don't do something like, Anyways, yeah. Andy, you were going to say something? Uh, well, yeah, Jay kind of said it. Like he, when people ask me that, I just tell them, like, I don't, I say, I literally say, because I don't understand them, because <laughs> I don't know where they're coming from. So I literally just say, I love it. So it's not that big a deal of me to get, to be motivated and be disciplined. It's, it's a weird not, question. Well, because it, it's it, honest, it's... But, but I'm honest and they can't discredit me like I'm giving them a bullshit answer. Like, listen. I just love it. I, I like doing it. I don't know how else to do it. Um, I can't say like, oh, well, I just, you know, you got to be, you got to be, you know, dedicated. You got to have these goals and all this stuff. Like, yeah, I, I have those. But honestly, like we, we all just love it. So I think we have to realize that the people who do love it, they're not going to be the ones asking us this question. So th like I said, th th you're just getting the, you're, we're just singling these questions out because that's what we get and that's what we don't understand. But there's also the other side who people do love, but they just don't bug us about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Like true. I said, no, I, I, my, so like my, what I'm saying is all these people have always uh, existed. The entitled, all the ones we're talking about, it's just that because of social media, we hear it more and they're coming to us because we're, you know, we, they follow us and they're looking at us for, for advice. Um, without social media, they would just, Bug someone in the gym or something you know what i'm saying yeah i've totally had this yeah. argument with people before it's like people say infidelity is brought brought on by facebook <clears throat> it's like dude facebook is like walking outside it's not going to bring on infidelity or you know bad things or people talking shit no people are going to talk shit if they go outside you know social media it's just a platform and it's getting your voice out there so inherently like social media isn't bad it's not bad for athletes i think it's great I think it's great that you can go out and post. I, I think it's great I can post my selfies and look better than I am and, you know, have people looking at it. But that's like me walking outside without a shirt. I mean, I've got to acknowledge that it comes with shit. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> it's, neat, it's neat what Andy's saying, though, because, like, that, that is a big thing is we do self-curate our world, right? Yeah. Like, if I'm seeing all these people who are upset you know, and I'm getting all these DMs. It's like, well, why am I attracting all these people? Like, I know it's because I have a journaling book. So people buy that and then they see me as that kind of person. So they Jay, do you want to plug your book now? <laughs> you want to wait till leave? No, I'm joking. It's right there. The, the yellow one. It's a new one. We're, we're, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. that. We're going to let you guys, you guys have a lot going on. But like, we, but like, yeah, I get it. Like we, it's like, sometimes like, I guess, I guess hearing Andy say it, I'm like, yeah, you're right. We self curate. So if I'm getting all these people, there's two things like maybe all those people are coming out and I'm following them or maybe the ones who are DMing me, I'm attracting them. So it's like, maybe it isn't as bad as you think, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're looking for it basically. So that's why it's coming to you. Yeah. Cause I, I remember. Um, so when I first started going to the gym, I was, I started lifting in, in high school because of football. I was like a freshman. Um, but then after that, when I was done playing football, I didn't know how to like work out. Like I knew like, I knew how to like lift for power for, for football. So like I actually became a personal trainer and I'd always ask all these personal trainers or big dudes who power or who bodybuild and all that stuff. And I probably sounded uh, annoying and uh, not entitled because like I was, I was like, kind of overweight I was I was football fat and so I was like how do I get lean how do I get that I'm like and I can't have that in two months I can't take this supplement and all that stuff so I think part of it is like information and just experience um 
and and yeah, I, I wanted it in two months. Like who doesn't, <laughs> right? Like how do I don't who doesn't want to squat eight hundred pounds in, in in two years? Like so, like I said, I, I think it's just you know the the squeaky wheel gets the attention, and we're talking about that. But that's not to say there aren't fucking entitled people out there, and and we have to like set them straight. And I think because we have that position on social media. It's up to us to whether we want to uh, address them and help them out or we ignore them or whatever. I mean, there's no right or wrong. Um, I'm just like, there's days when I don't want to deal with that and I just don't talk to them or don't respond. And there's other days <laughs> when I will help out. So it's just kind of like, you know, what, what do you want to be known as, you know? So that's kind of like what I'm talking about. I think an interesting way to look at it too is, so maybe all those people have always been out there. Like let's say we're talking about people who need help and they're attracted to bodybuilding or powerlifting to give them a, an anchor. Um, but at least they're finding it now. Right. Yeah. So, so at least they're finding it because I've had, I've seen a lot of women, especially when it comes to um, especially when it comes to like figure and bikini and all that. Like I've seen a lot of women who, you see their personalities change as they get closer to the competition. You, their, their confidence goes up. Like as their body gets more and more closer to the figure competition, you know, their posture starts to change, their attitude starts to change. Um, and even if they might be somewhat miserable and on zero carbs, their, their self-esteem at those moments I've noticed seems higher. I don't know if it actually is because obviously I'm an external observer, but the self-esteem seems higher. And then for about three weeks after the show, the self-esteem is still higher, but you hit that fourth week and that rebound comes in and then you can see the person kind of shrivel a little bit. Do you guys notice that? Like, Definitely. You that? Joe, Joe, you must, cause you work with a lot of clients and yeah. Then like I, you see that that's like, they call it like the, the, I was actually explaining this to like someone the other day, like it's like the, you have like the post show high where it's like after the show, it's like, you're still on that high feeling of like competing and you, you still look great, this and that. But then it's like, you get to a point where it's like, you can't maintain that type of condition all the time. It's just not practical. It's not productive if you're trying to continue to improve. And like, you know, in most cases, it's just not healthy to try and stay that lean, especially for females. So you know, they get to that point where it's like they start to, you know, get a, put on a little bit of body fat. And then it's like you can start to see the other things get into play where it's like, you know, they might start eating more and do other things get involved. And then they start to hate the way they look. And you just you see that like almost like up and down spiral where I feel like for some people, you know, when social media is involved with that, like it just makes it worse with those extremes. But yeah, I think it's an individual thing and like how you handle it. But it's, uh, yeah, that's one thing I've noticed just with like male or female competitors with like the highs and lows. Cause I can, you know, we all know there's, there's hormones in play, like with this, like competing, especially in bodybuilding. So, you know, I know even with myself, like I would never make any big decisions just before, or just after a show, because I don't think my headspace is in that like point to make a big decision because you're not really like, I, like, I don't, you're not normal, you know, you're not thinking normally because like, you're so like in the, before the show, you're just so focused on that, that like, you know, something could happen and you're just like, ah, whatever, fuck it. I don't care. Um, and like right after the show, it's like, you're on that high feeling of like just competing, you know, your mood might be elevated, but then you hit that point a few weeks later and it's like, things start to go in the opposite direction. And it's like, so I think it's a combination of like not having an immediate goal set right after and like seeing your physique not look the same as it did on that day. So you know, it's also physiological. It's, it's a physiological yeah. response because I've been, so one of my friends is doing her PhD and eating disorders is a big, you know, interest of hers. And physiologically, when you're hungry, you are doing some really crazy stuff. Like the behaviors change. So someone who has bulimia or anorexia, and I hate to say it, but some of these physique girls, some of these, some of these fucking bodybuilder, male bodybuilders, maybe even myself sometimes, I, I'm like, am I borderline? eating disorder right now, you know, and you've got to struggle with that because your, your thought process dictates how you're going to behave and how your moods are going to be affected by those behaviors. Now, power lifters, I don't think get this as much because you guys don't have to be as stringent with your weight. I mean, you take a diuretic before weigh-ins and whatever, 
but you don't have to be like 4% body fat. But when you're 4 or 5% body fat as a male or like 8%, 9% body fat as a female, your, your physiology is, 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 is dictating your behavior because you're, star you're starving. You're, you're, you're like not supposed to be there. So post-show, then you start loading in the foods and then there's other factors like guilt and, and then there's the factors of physiological like hunger and it's like bulimia, right? And, and fullness and the cycle just uh, perpetuates. So it's, it's like a physical thing. Anyways, do you guys see what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's so. When I was bodybuilding, I I went through that too. I was bulimic. I would fucking taste. I would like put food in my mouth and spit it out. I I smell Oreos. Oreos. I smell yeah, yeah. Oreos. Yeah, yeah. But also, uh, you know, you're on drugs and like, you know, close to the show, you're not thinking right. And I've made some really bad decisions during that time, and that that's part of why I don't bodybuild is because I, I just. I just didn't give a shit. I did a lot of stuff. I didn't care about the consequences. And I think that's kind of, kind of why I, I, I stay, stick with powerlifting because it's not as extreme uh, yeah. physiologically. Um, and the rebound after a show or a competition isn't, isn't you know, as bad too. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I, 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 I actually got a theory, Andy, like if you know any, you know, uh, manic depressives or, bipolar disorder. I've got a theory that you put yourself, a lot of competitors can put themselves in the um, stage of mania. Like your, your psychological, I guess your neurochemical balance would put yourself in a state where you just don't give a fuck. You're totally disassociated with reality. Your decision-making is poor. And maybe I'm just speaking out of experience, but I, I would like to do some research on this one day, if I can, to see how many people fall into that category where eight weeks or 12, maybe eight or four weeks before the show, they put themselves in a state of, 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 of mania or hypermania, which is really destructive and, and could be really bad. You're not sleeping. You, you match all the criteria. If you look at the DSM and you look at this disorder, like I guarantee you most bodybuilders are there. But anyways, this is, we're, we're far deviating and it's been like an hour. Do you guys, I, I don't want to be an asshole by taking up Andy's moving. I, do you guys want to cut it now? or Because we could go oh, on for I could go I'm, on forever. I'm okay with wrapping up just because I was still going to train tonight. So Yeah, okay. You training at Florida Fitness? Uh, they open? No, no, they're not open. Uh, I was going to go to Save On just because the uh, new body closes early. So Okay, I'll let you do yeah, that. I'll go to Save On. And, and Andy, Andy, what time is it in California over there? Uh, it's 2.45. Oh, well, you I, guys... I still have to move and I still have to do all my programming for my athletes and stuff too. Okay. Okay. And, 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 uh, well, before you leave, I know I want to get Jay to speak to his stuff because Jay, you got a really interesting journaling book, um, yeah, Sisyphus and, and Jay knows I didn't get this because of Jay, but this is my, he knows that I love Albert Camus. So I don't know where he got this whole Sisyphus thing from, but we share that commonality that we love the myth of Sisyphus there, so. Yeah. So and you name your journal after it. What's that? And you name your journaling system after it. Yeah, well, I named, I have like a, a thing I call Sisyphus is Smiling. Right, that's your. Play off of the myth of Sisyphus. It's not that, because myth of Sisyphus says we should imagine him smiling, and I'm saying, no, he is smiling. But yeah, you have to read cause it. Because he's, he's pushing that boulder up the hill. I let Andy move. But, uh, but yeah, basically it's just a journal, and it's full of prompts. So it'd be like, if I bring 5% more pur purposefulness to my life today, I will improve my relationships. My career might get better. I might become a better communicator. I might bring more enthusiasm. You just finish the sentence all over the page over and over. And what that does is it forces a person to think about various aspects of their life or things that they think about for more than the five or 10 six seconds that our attention spans usually let us. So think of something... <laughs> If you're writing for two minutes, you know, you just write for two minutes and people who live passive lives tend to, and you just finish that sentence over and over and over. You've thought about it about 400% more than you would have if you saw it on an Instagram post, right? And then for the rest of the day, that's going to linger in your mind. So for the rest of your day, you're going to think, oh, people who live passive lives tend to 
be shitty or something like whatever your your brain thinks of. So that's the idea of the journal. Is it just to be of, like more introspective about your yeah? You're just, prompt, you're just prompting people to basically be more, you know, self-responsible, self-accountable, self-reliant. You know, just think think more about how they can improve their own lives, basically. Okay. And your and your app, uh, Jay. You, you and Paul O'Neill have that app. Yeah, we have our app Metro Life, uh, which is a tracking app, a health and wellness tracking app with alerts and recommendations. So you track a lot of your daily metrics, such as like hours of sleep, quality of sleep, uh, your diet, quality of your diet, um, your mood, your ability to focus, your libido, all these different things. There's also a mental health component in there that we base off of the Canadian Mental Health Association. And uh, just the mere act of tracking these things alone, like I said, with the journal, the act of doing this puts the questions in your head, which helps you make the associations. Most people who are like most athletes, most of us, we already have all of the good associations to like, to prompt good behaviors, but not everyone does that. For some reason, some people don't make the associations that their mood could be connected to how they've been eating and how they've been sleeping, or they might not make the connections to say their libido and their lack of sleep or their mental health. Uh, with all these different things. So that's what the app is geared towards and helping coaches get their clients to use it so that they can monitor uh, their clients without having to talk to them daily. They could see how they're doing. But yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I've tried your app. It's, it's, really, it's really helpful, but I was in a bad place when I tried your app. So I didn't come out too well, but I did see some improvements. You know, it's like hills and valleys. Cool. Okay. And um, I guess we can always, where do, where do we find that stuff? Uh, the book you can find in, on Amazon and the app is in Google play, Apple, Apple app store. What's the app called? Metro life. M E R I life. Okay. okay. And Andy, you got a, you got a bunch of stuff going on. I, I looked at your, your page and there's a million things. So whatever you want to bug, <laughs> Yeah, I, I have so many sponsors, um, but I, I don't need to plug them all. Uh, I'll, just, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just plug my company, Iron Rebel, uh, which uh, I've had the fortune of becoming a part owner like a year and a half ago. And we've really pretty much turned it around. Um, you know, it was on a downslope uh, with, with prior ownership, but we've turned around uh, with me and, uh, you know, Luke Carroll. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So we, we, we went on board at the same time and we've, we've turned it around and it's been really awesome. And we, we've had, you know, we've been having record sales every month. So that's great. So Iron Rebel, uh, we're a bodybuilding powerlifting brand uh, with apparel and lifting gear. Um, and we just, you know, every month or sorry, every day, just try and bring out new stuff, improve things and, um, you know, spread personally for me, I, I always want to be around the sport of powerlifting whether it's in coaching seminars or, you know, the, the, the company Iron Rebel uh, putting out good stuff. So, you know, you can check that out. Just ironrebel.com. Pretty simple. Uh, uh, <laughs> and Andy knows he answers my emails when I don't get my stuff fast enough to Canada. I'm like, Andy, <laughs> can you ship this? I'm, 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 I'm going to make him ship my knee wraps. You, you guys didn't ship my knee, knee wraps last week because you, you're waiting for them, I think. Yeah, it's, with COVID, um, just shipping in general, everywhere, especially international, it just, they'll give you ETAs, but it's never the same. Um, so with Black Friday, we just wanted to put everything that we have coming online so that everybody can take advantage of the sale and purchase it. But it might just get out a little later because things are not arriving on time. And that makes my life fucking hell because I deal with customer service. And, but uh, you know what? At the same time, I'm glad I'm doing customer service because it's taught me so much about being more patient and not, and being more politically correct, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I need that. Yeah, it's an awesome company. I'm, I'm actually one of your ambassadors, eh? So yeah, um, I'm really happy to be uh, with uh, an ambassador for Iron Rebel because you guys make some really good lifting stuff. Like I got your elbow sleeves, yeah. unfortunately too tight. So don't get them too tight because those are really tight elbow sleeves. So I hope my knee wraps aren't too tight either. Because you say go a size down, right? For for the elbows, 
for the round uh, two. Uh, uh, the elbow, sleeves. The elbow sleeves. I mean, that's person dependent because someone might have bigger forearms or bigger biceps. It, so it, it kind of just depends on how how tight you want it or not. Like I don't, I like mine tight as hell. I have like bruises and, and red marks after I use them. So everyone's different. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And same with your knee wraps. I mean, you can wrap it as tight as you want. So. Well, knee sleeves. That's what I got. Knee sleeves, sleeves yeah. not wraps. But... Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, anything else, Andy, you want to talk uh, about? No, or... that's pretty much it. You, you know, I'm on Instagram that underscore huge Asian underscore guy. And, you know, not trying to promote everything right here. So it's fine. All right, man. If I'm, if, you know, any of us are ever in California, I would have, I saw your sushi eating video. Like oh, the, yeah. I, I, I want to challenge you to sushi, you know. Oh, well, I'm not <laughs> at my peak. When I was bodybuilding, I, you know, my cheat meals would be just an all out freaking eating fest. So my stomach isn't like, like that conditioned to do that anymore because I don't eat like that anymore. But if you, if you are coming, and I have a heads up, I'll start, you know, conditioning. You're my training. Yeah, I got to train for it. <laughs> That'll be a PR. Yeah, my next PR. 300 pieces. Get ready, man. All right. Um, thanks for coming on, guys. I, I had, there was a great, like, discussion. Great, especially near the end. I really enjoyed it. Um, and Joe, thanks again for hosting this on your channel and having us and letting us do this thing. So... Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad like both of you guys could come on today like and and talk with us and uh, you know take the time out of your schedules. So I appreciate it as well. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy. All right guys, it's a wrap. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it and stop the video. Peace.